audio here. Liz, can you hear me okay? Yep, it's good. Okay, perfect. All right, so I, ho I hope I have what might be an interesting session for you guys where we take a look at some advanced techniques for getting and working with data with Power BI. Um, we have some exciting things coming with Pragmatic Works here soon uh, that I think you guys will be really interested in. We're going to have some things like uh, custom visualization classes we're going to be launching this week, and uh, we already have a streaming on-demand training class that we have. And, and as Liz mentioned, we had a three-hour uh, Power BI workshop that we did that was recorded and available for free for you on our website as well. So if you go to pragmaticworks.com, you can find that. Um, today what I wanted to do is kind of piggyback off some of the things that we've done in the past where we've talked about how to do some basic things with Power BI and talk today about some more advanced techniques for working with data and some more advanced techniques with just dealing with complex business scenarios. And so what I'm going to do is I don't have a ton of slides intentionally because it's going to be primarily demos, almost 95% uh, demos today. Uh, but I wanted to be able to show you some situations that you might run into and how to deal with them and solve them using Power BI. And these will be some common scenarios that using other tools might be very difficult to solve, but Power BI makes it easy. And so that's what I want to walk you through today. Um, if you're not familiar with who I am, uh, my name is Devin Knight. I'm the training director here at Pragmatic Works. So uh, any kind of the formal training that we do usually goes to me in some way. Uh, I am a Microsoft Data Platform MVP. That's just the fancy uh, upgraded version of a SQL Server MVP, I guess. And I've written several books, uh, not on Power BI, uh, but mainly on the traditional BI. You, you actually will find some Power BI books, but not a whole lot. The reason being is because Power BI changes so frequently. Uh, I've kind of decided not to write a, a book, not, not a more traditional book. I'm looking at doing some digital writing here in the future. But um, if anyone were to come out with a Power BI book, it would likely be out of date by the time I hit the shelves. Uh, but I do have some more traditional BI and business intelligence books out there you can certainly look up. I also run a local user group here in Jacksonville, Florida. That's where I'm from. And uh, we do all things from B Power BI related to traditional BI to more data platform, traditional SQL Server, DBA type topics. And I also blog at a website called devonnightsql.com. Uh, as I mentioned just a few moments ago, I'm going to have some big releases here this week. Uh, Liz is working with, this, with me on launching a new weekly a blog series that will be on the Pragmatic Works blog as well as my own where we're going to be releasing a basically a free class. We're going to have once a week uh, a new video module for a custom visualizations with Power BI course that we're going to be releasing. So you should be able to see that coming up very soon, uh, probably tomorrow or Thursday. All right, so I, like I said, I don't have a ton of slides. I'm going to get straight into some demos. So what I'd like to do to start us off is set up a scenario here and then talk you through how we can solve the scenario using Power BI. And the scenario that I have for you here first is going to be importing data from complex files. And so let me show you an example of a file that I'm talking about that I'm identifying here as complex. And this is probably a type of file that you've seen in the past. Let me close out my PowerPoint here for a moment. There we go. And the type of file that we're looking at here is one that has subtotals in it, basically. So what we're looking at, just to give you some context of the data, we have uh, a bunch of folks that work for us. Here's their different positions. Here's their age, the starting uh, date, and their salary. And then as part of the file, there's a subtotal row that appears at the, as almost like a header subtotal row on each section here. So I'm seeing there's a subtotal row here for the city that they're from, Edinburgh, where they're, that's a subtotal row. I can see a subtotal row for London. I can see a subtotal row for New York a little bit further down. And the problem is I don't want to import that, that record for the city that they're from as its own row. What I'd like to do instead is see an actual row, that, or I should say a column in here for city that I would add in here on the far right and let Power BI fill that down and automatically give me the city for each of these folks that have different uh, dev positions here for me. So I can see uh, regional director, developer, all these listed in here. So hopefully that's clear on what I want to do. I want to get rid of the subtotal row. I don't care so much about the subtotal salary, but what I would like to do instead is add in a city for a new column here so that way I can see what city each of these individuals are from. All right, so that's my scenario, probably a very common scenario where you're dealing with subtotal data inside of your data sets. So let's take a look at how we can solve this problem. I'm going to go ahead and close out of the file so it doesn't think I'm got it locked or, or holding it open for any reason. And I'm going to go ahead and open up Power BI here. Okay. All right, so what I'm going to do, this is very focused, and a lot of what we're going to do in this session is focused around dealing with the data import side of things. So what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and start by pulling in some data using the Get Data section 
up in the top ribbon. So you'll see up in the top ribbon, underneath home section, we can go to get data. Uh, now this is an advanced session, so I will consider some of this stuff as knowledge that you likely already have. Uh, for example, get data, that's where you're always going to get started. And so I'm going to go ahead and select get data. And I'm going to tell it that I want to pull in data from that Excel file that we selected just a few moments ago. So I'll go ahead and select Excel here. All right, so I'll select Excel. That will launch open a basically a search window here where I can go find that file and where it's located. And I can see that I have my file with groupings uh, example right here. And I'll select file with groupings. That will launch open the Navigator pane inside of Power BI, which allows me to really search through files or search through databases. In this case, it's showing me a, an Excel file at this level here. And then I can see all of the spreadsheets or uh, even Excel tables would appear below it. In this case, I only have one spreadsheet below. It's called Sheet 1. And I can see, if I select Sheet 1, a preview of it on the right-hand side. And that way, I know pretty clearly what is uh, inside this file. Okay, So I can see it before I even select it. I'm going to go ahead and select Sheet 1 here, and rather than hitting the load on the bottom, if you've done, gone through one of our intro sessions before in the past, uh, if I liked the data as it is right now, I would hit load and that would bring it into my data model. But in this case, I actually have some data manipulation I want to do to this first. So before I hit load, I'm going to go ahead and select Edit. When I click on Edit, it's going to launch open a query editor here. Uh, and by the way, just to, to give you some context of some of the things that's going, around, going on around me here, you'll see it says the preview may be up to 24 days old. Basically, that's telling you that the, you have a preview of the data inside this window, and it caches that preview, meaning it's a subset of the data. Um, and if you want to refresh it, you just simply hit the refresh button. So that tells you that Power BI does do some caching behind the scenes, so that way whenever you come to the preview window, it can load it a bit faster. I'm going to hit refresh to make sure I get the latest copy of that. And the first thing I want to do also, which I always recommend as a best practice, is to go ahead and name the data set. So on the right-hand side here, you can see right now it's called Sheet 1. Let's go ahead and rename this. I'll call this something like uh, Job Salaries is fine. All right. All right, so I've named this data set. Now, really the tough part here is how do I work with the data that I have? Because you can see here that it looks like I have the city showing up as a subtotal, but really I want it in here as a column and a city column in here. So how we're going to work with this is we're going to start by creating a new column. And we're going to create a new custom column where basically we take this value for the, for the name, where it has the, where most of these are the name of the person, it also has the name of the city here, and I'm going to take this value out of the city and place it in its own column. So to do that, we're going to write a little bit of an M query, a very small M expression to be able to copy out that value and bring it into its own column. To write and create a new column based off of an M script, you can either go to the advanced editor, which is one way. Okay, it's maybe the slightly more complicated way to do it. You can go to the advanced editor, which I'm highlighting right here. Or if you want to do it a little bit easier, you can come up to where it says add column. There's an add column uh, tab here up in the top. And you can tell it that you want to add in a custom column. Now you'll notice there are a couple other different types of columns that you can do. Uh, there are conditional columns. This might be a new way you can solve this problem that I'm trying to do right now. I'll show you that way here in a moment. This is a new uh, type of transform add column that's been placed in here. Uh, you can also do duplicate column, which is basically going to take a column and duplicate it exactly as it appears. Or you'll see there's an add index column. And an add index column, essentially what that does is it's almost like an identity column. If you've worked with uh, SQL tables and you wanted to have an auto-generated value for a, for a column, uh, that's what an identity column is. If I selected to do an identity column from 1, that means it would start the first row would show up as 1, going to number 2, 3, 4, 5, all the way to however many number of rows I have. If I do an identity column that starts with 0, it's going to start with 0, of course. So it would start with 0, 1, 2, 3, that's, that sort of thing. And basically that index column is just a number that's auto-generated from 1 to however many rows that you have. Now, the other thing here that we can do is a custom column. This is where you can write a, an M, M expression that calculates out and determines what, new col what the new column is going to look like based off of an M expression that you write. So we have a couple ways we can do this. We can either do a conditional column, which I'll show you here in a moment. That's a new UI that's been designed for doing basically what we're trying to do. Or we can do a custom column. So let me show you the hard way first, and then I'll show you the new additions that have been added in recently here in a moment. So I'm going to select Add Custom Column. And I'm going to move this down a little bit so we can actually see the data in the background. And I'll zoom in on this so you can see it as well. So what we're going to do is we're going to create a new column here called City. So I'll name this City here. 
and then we'll come down to where you see the formula section and we'll write out a little formula that actually brings back the city name right here that you see in row number one and we're only going to return back that value if let's say position is null so if position is null then we know that must be one of the subtotal rows and we want to bring back the value of name so hopefully that makes sense logically here's what it looks like from a code perspective now if you're uh, new to the mQuery language it is case sensitive so uh, some of the things that you'll write in here you need to make sure that you do lowercase or uppercase wherever it's appropriate in this case if I want to do an if statement I would do a lowercase if okay and I would say if the position, which is the columns you can see listed here on the right-hand side, so I can say if the position, I'll grab that, just double-click on it, if the position is null, then return back the name column, else null. All right, so basically what I'm saying here is if the value of position, which you see right here, is null, which it is when it comes to the uh, subtotal rows, then I want to return back the name column. That's the value that I see right here. If it's not, meaning all these other rows that don't have a val don't have a null value, then I want to show null where that where that occurs. Okay. So let me show you what this looks like. If I hit OK on this, very simple little if statement here. Notice the if statement actually reads very much like English. So I can say if the position is null, then bring back name. Else null. So if I hit OK on this, notice what happens. It creates a brand new column for me here on the right hand side. And this brand new column does return back the city and nulls everywhere else. Okay, and I'm going to show you how we're going to work with this here in just a moment. But before I do that, let me show you the other way that we could have done this as well. Instead of writing that if statement that I did a moment ago, we could have also done a conditional column. Okay, so a conditional column, the way it works is basically the same way as an if then else statement. So if I select conditional column, I can say if the position column uh, equals, and I can say null here, then return back name. So it does basically the same thing that we saw a few moments ago. Notice here you can add multiple rules, so if I want to add another condition into this, you could easily do that here as well. I could also put an otherwise, so this is like an else, so if this is not true, so if the value is not null, then otherwise return back null. Okay. If it is null, then return back the name. This is the same thing as what we did just a moment ago with the if-then-else statement. It's just a nice little UI they wrapped around it. And I'll call this column city2. We should see the results have the exact same uh, end result here. So I'll hit OK, and you can see they work exactly the same. They've just created a nice little UI around that conditional logic that I did in the first example. It's called a conditional column, and it does, like I said, basically the same thing as an if-then-else statement. All right, I don't really need both of these, so I'm going to get rid of the second one that I did, and I can do that by going ahead and hitting the X on the Applied Steps section to get rid of that second example that I did. And so what I'll do with this now is I'll tell it that I want to basically take the value for city and duplicate it all the way down where these nulls are until I have a value to replace it with. So basically take Inboro here and we'll duplicate it all the way down until I see London and duplicate London all the way down until I see New York and duplicate it all the way down. And this is done through an example or through a, a feature called fill down. There's a transform that's built into the query editor that allows you to do fill down, which basically does exactly what I described. Take a value, duplicate it down until you have something to replace it with. So if I want to do something like that, I can come up to the transform tab or the transform ribbon up at the very top and find the, the option in here called fill. You'll see if you look towards the middle of the screen here, there's a bunch of transforms that you can select from, including pivot, unpivot, rename, detect data types. And then the one that we want here is called move. And if I hit the down arrow on move, I, I'm sorry, not move, I have fill, I can tell it whether or not I want to do fill down or fill up. Fill down means it's going to take the value here and duplicate it all the way down. Fill up means it's going to take the value on the bottom and duplicate it going upwards. In my case, I want to take, so that would be depending on where the subtotal row is, right? If the subtotal row is at the top, which mine is, then I want to do fill down. If the subtotal row is at the bottom, then I want to do fill up, which you have an option for as well. In my case, I want to do fill down. Take the value of the city, duplicate it down until you have something to replace it with. So I'll select fill down here, and you can see immediately the value is duplicated down until it runs into the next potential value, which is London, and then it duplicates those values all the way down as well. Okay, that's the fill down option. Really, really neat transform built into Power BI to be able to solve these, these sort of problems of dealing with subtotals. All right, and other problems for that matter. There's a lot of reasons why you might use it.
All right, so I have that value taken care of. Now I have a new column in here for city. Now if I want to actually uh, get rid of that subtotal row, I can now. Uh, because, for example, I don't really need the subtotal salary because I can get that out of just the way I build my report if I wanted to. So if I want to get rid of that subtotal row that I still have sitting here, I can filter out the null position or age or start date. And if I filter out the null position, for example, just by hitting the little filter option, let me zoom in on that so you can make sure you see it. If I hit the down arrow on position, I can tell it that I want to filter out all the null values just by unchecking the null value here. You can also type it. And once I uncheck null and hit OK, you can see my subtotal rows are completely gone. Now that's not a, really a bad thing at all because I can simply build out those subtotal rows again in my report in my reporting layer here in a few moments if I really wanted to keep them. But in this case, I basically got a file that was sent to me from a vendor that already had subtotal rows in it and I didn't want them. So I got rid of them. I now have in the data set that's looking pretty good. I can see city is duplicated all the way down. You'll notice even though I got rid of the row, that had the subtotal and the name of the city in it, it still retains the city in here for the following transforms later on. So just because I got rid of a row that had Edinburgh in it, doesn't mean that, it doesn't, that I'm not able to keep it still in here because of the way that the query editor works. It's very serial. It moves um, in, a, in a way where it's not running things in parallel, it's doing things all sequentially. So it actually removes that row that had the city name after I already used it for the fill down example and after I already used it for the custom column example. So it's okay to remove that row even though I'm using it here at an earlier point. All right, so I've got the data in a pretty good set here so I can go ahead and hit home and close and apply and I can use that data however I want to now. I can build out a report. If I wanted to, I could even build out a report that basically duplicates what I had before if I did something like a matrix and did a matrix based off of the city Okay, so I can see all the cities. Let me make that text a little larger so you can actually see it. Okay, there we go. And then I can bring in anything else I wanted into that matrix so I can see something like the salary. There's my subtotals that I saw earlier. Or if I wanted to start adding in things like the names and the positions, I could get all that in here as well. Okay? So very easy to do, very easy to replicate what we had in the other report. Uh, or I can start to build like more traditional dashboard type reporting items from this as well. I could bring this into something like a tree map if I wanted to, and now I'm able to visualize it in, a, in maybe a way that makes more sense uh, for a dashboard's perspective. Okay, so that's our first example. Our first example uh, of more complex file you're trying to deal with, importing that file in, and then being able to apply some more advanced transforms to it. Let's take a look at our next example. So I have another slide here. Let me set this example up a little bit. And this example, what we're going to be looking at is how you can basically loop over a, a set of web pages. Now, you may have seen me show this example in some other context, but I'm actually going to be doing a different scenario here. Uh, what we're going to be looking at is a, a website that has in it uh, plane crash data. Okay, so don't forgive me for this somewhat mor morbid data here. It's really the business problem I want you to focus in on because it, this, this website fit the business problem really well. And so basically what we're going to be doing is we're going to be going to this website and what they have on this website is multiple years uh, for each year that there are, there are plane crashes that occur and all of the records for those plane crashes. And rather than me having to open each one of those web pages, I'd rather make it so that, it, that Power BI loops through each of those web pages and brings me back all of the data at the same time. So let me show you what I mean here. I'm going to open up a website and you are welcome to go use this website later, it's not mine. Uh, but it's called planecrashinfo.com. Again, forgive me for the morbid data, but it, it actually suits our business problem here that we're trying to solve uh, very nicely. And so what I want to do here is I want to take the data that they have on this website. If I look underneath this databases section here, there's a databases option. I can see they have uh, data from 1920 to 2016 here, almost 100 years worth of data. And what I'd like to do is I want to get the data from all of those years at once. I want to get all 90, 96 years worth of data here and bring it in all at the same time, and Power BI can do that. And here's how. If I want to solve this problem, I, I need to do a couple things. The first thing I want to do is go ahead and pick a year. So it doesn't really matter which year I pick, but I need to start by pulling a data from one year. And if you've ever done any looping in other tools, like SSIS, if you worked with SSIS, you know how to do, you might know how to do looping. If you've done looping in any kind of source system or, or, or ETL system before in the past, you always want to start by figuring out how to import the data from one file first and then worry about looping it later. Okay? So in our case, I'm going to pick the year, let's say 1933 here. And I can see in this it has an instance of every one of the uh, records on this website. And so what I want to do is I want to get the data from this website that we're looking at right here and I want to be able to pull this information in. 
And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy the URL that we have in the address bar at the very top. And I'm going to go ahead and copy that out. You can right click and copy or I'll just do control C. And you'll notice inside of the URL itself, it has kind of an entry point here for me where I could pass in the years that I want to be able to uh, pull information back from. So I want to be able to take the URL that I've now copied and be able to pass in new years into this and almost automate it so that it does it all on its own. And when a new, new year is added, I want it to automatically add that information in as well. All right, so what I'll do is I'll copy the URL here. I'm going to go back over to the Power BI desktop application. I'll even delete this just so there's no confusion here. And so what I'd like to do is go ahead and import the data from this one year first, and then we'll work on how we can import from multiple years next. All right, so to do this from one year, I'm going to go up to the Get Data section here again inside the Home ribbon, and I'll select from Web. So I'll select the Web option here. I'll go ahead and paste in the URL. So I'm just going to paste in the URL that we copied off of the Web page a moment ago, and hit OK. All right, so it's going to bring me back some information here. It's going to bring me into the Navigator pane where I can see the website and the two objects that Power BI was able to detect from that website. One is called Document, which doesn't really have anything of value uh, from a data perspective. And then the second one here called Table Zero actually has the data in it that we'd like to use. You can see all the instances that are showing up on that website. And I can take this information and go ahead and bring this into Power BI by simply checking it off right here and then hitting Edit to bring it into the Query Editor. All right, so I'll go ahead and check off Table Zero and choose Edit to bring this into the editor, the Power BI Query Editor. All right, so it's now brought this into the query editor here for me, and now I can start to determine how do I want to manipulate this data, what do I want to do with it, and then the, my next step is going to be how do I loop over and bring every one of the years in here as opposed to just the one. All right, so a couple things that we can do to play around with this data if we wanted to. You'll see there's this, uh, again, I've predicted for the morbid data, but it is interesting as far as being able to pull it in and pull it off a website here. But I can see here for the last column that I have has multiple metrics in it. Uh, it's just kind of labeled it as fatalities, but I'd like to actually break this into multiple metrics here if I could. And so if I wanted to take the value that I have inside this last column and split them into multiple columns, I could do that by right-clicking on the fatalities column, and I can select that I want to do a split column based off of a delimiter. Okay, so I can take this and say, well, I want to split this based on the forward slash that I have and then split it again based on the open parentheses that I have, and I can make multiple fields off of this by using the split column transform here. All right, so I'll select split column by delimiter, and what I'd like to do is I want to split the column based off of a custom delimiter that we have in here because you'll notice in here there's not really a forward slash in here that I can use as a delimiter. There's comma, there's colon. Uh, but if you have a custom delimiter that you want to do, you can come down to where it says custom. And I can tell it that the delimiter that I have here is a forward slash. So I'll just select forward slash here and make sure that it's added as my custom delimiter. You can also tell it how many occurrences of the delimiter are that you want to split off on. Uh, in my case, I, it really doesn't matter what I, I choose here, but I'm going to choose the leftmost delimiter. I'm not anticipating more than one forward slash appearing in here. Uh, but just to be certain that I only capture one, I'm going to say, give me the leftmost delimiter. If I had multiple slashes, then I could say after each instance of that slash, I want to create a new column, basically. Uh, in my case, I'm going to say the leftmost delimiter and hit OK. Okay, so that now creates a split where I have two columns in here, one for uh, what I believe is going to be the uh, air, air fatalities, and then we'll go ahead and split this into another one, and we'll split it into another one as well. So let's, do, let's go ahead and split these into multiple columns before I rename them. I'm going to go split this next, uh, the, the, the remainings of the uh, column that we started off with again. So if I want to split this one, I'll right click on it and go down to split column again by another delimiter. But notice it's not going to be a forward slash. This time it's going to be an open parentheses. So I'll tell it to split by, by delimiter again. And I want to split by a custom delimiter once again, just like we did in the first case. I'll split on a custom delimiter, and I'm going to split this time on an open parentheses. So I'll select open parentheses, and I'll do it at the leftmost instance of that delimiter again, just in case there's some other parentheses that shows up in there. I want to make sure I uh, do it correctly. All right, so I'll select to split on an open parentheses at the leftmost delimiter and hit OK. And you can see now that I have three separate columns in here. And we can go ahead and rename these now. I know this one is um, air fatalities. 
I know this, this one is how many people were on board the plane. By the way, this information is on the website. That's how I know what they are. So how many people were aboard the plane? And then this last one is round fatalities. Okay, again, forgive me for the morbid data, but it's, it's uh, a good, interesting uh, solution here. All right, now I still have an issue here. If you look at the data, you'll notice that Power BI automatically converted the data types for me here. It converted the data type here to a numeric value, a number here, a number here. But this last one is still in here as a text. You can tell that by looking at the little indicator at the top left of the column header. And the reason that is is because you can see there's still a character in here, a closed parentheses that is preventing it from automatically converting data types for me. And I wouldn't be able to convert it as a data type manually either. So what I need to do is I need to basically strip out the closed parentheses on this last column to finish this up. So if I wanted to do that, I could right click on the ground fatalities and I could tell it that I want to remove a value or remove values here. And basically I can tell it that I want to get rid of that closed parenthesis. I don't need to do any more splitting here. I've done enough splitting of the data. I now want to go ahead and do a um, removing of a value. So I'll say replace value. And the value that I want to replace is a closed parenthesis, and I don't really want to replace it with anything. So I'll just leave that blank. No, no need to replace it with something else. Just leave that blank and then go ahead and hit OK. All right, so that now gave me three separate columns. You'll notice that this one still hasn't converted data types. That could be that there's some character in here that's causing an issue. I don't see one here offhand. But if I need to go ahead and convert the data type of that column to make sure it's in here as a whole number, I can do that by changing the data type by simply hitting the little indicator here and making this show up as a whole number. By the way, if you don't see these little indicators next to the column names that has the data type, that's because you might be running a slightly older version of the Power BI desktop. This, uh, the latest version that was released last, uh, actually earlier this month, I believe, gave you those little indicators that you're seeing here. Okay? All right. Great. So I now have uh, all three of the metrics that I want. This is looking good. I am going to go ahead and rename this query. So I'll call this uh, it doesn't really matter. I'll call this um, error events. Okay. Now my next step is to actually make this dynamic because right now we've got this data set set up, but it, there's nothing dynamic about it, right? It has one single year that it's bringing back, nothing more than that single year. So if I want to make it dynamic and have it more parameterized, then I need to go into the advanced editor to actually key in some parameters. Um, note, there are some parameters that have been added in. If you notice here underneath the Manage section, the last release of the Power BI desktop also added in, uh, let's see, where is it at? Oh, right here, Manage Parameters. There's this new feature in here called Parameters that is already built in. It's like a UI design for dealing with parameters. Uh, there's a little bit of a different context for this. This is actually uh, used for more, I mean, we could use it in this context, but what it's more designed for is creating templates out of your Power BI solution. So you can create a template that has in it, that points to your data set, that, that actually you build visualizations on top of it. And the, uh, the context of using parameters is whenever someone goes to use that template, I want them to be able to change the data sources very easily between production and dev or maybe um, this customer, and customer A and customer B, and I want them to be able to plug in which um, which data sources that they easily drop in. And the parameters are a great way of doing that. You can actually, um, if we have some time, we'll talk about the context and those, how those make more sense than what we're doing right now. But for what we're doing now, we're going to do a little bit more of a manual process for creating these uh, parameters or these, these, these ways of making the query dynamic. To make the query dynamic, what we're going to do is we're going to go into the advanced editor, which you'll see right here. So I'll select the advanced editor. And then inside the advanced editor, and uh, again, I recommend watching some of our intro sessions that we, where we talk more about just how to get to this and what this is showing. Uh, I believe I even show how to, uh, how to read this a little bit in one of our previous ones where I talk about M queries. But what we're going to do in this one is I'm going to make this into a dynamic query. So to do that, what we're going to do is I'm going to come up to the beginning of the query here where it says let. And what I'm going to do is give myself a little real estate above it, and I'm going to add in a new variable basically. Okay? So the way I'll do this is I'll name the variable. You can call it whatever you want. You do it inside of parentheses. And uh, so I'll call this one year. Okay? And then I'll do a close parentheses here. And then do an equals greater than sign, which is basically how you declare a variable here in the M query language. Okay? And by the way, stands for mashup. It's a mashup language. So I've declared a variable. Now I need to go tell it where do I want to use that variable. 
there is probably a pretty clear area here that we want to use it. You can see here in the URL itself that the 1933, that's the hard-coded selection that we made earlier, I want to replace that hard-coded year with the parameter that we just created up top here. So to do that, I'll go where it says 1933, and I'm going to replace this 1933 by injecting a value into it. Now, one thing I should point out to you, you'll notice that there's double quotes around this URL here. So notice there's double quotes that start that end here and begin here. Why am I bringing that up? Well, I'm bringing that up because that tells you that the URL has to evaluate as a string. So if I'm going to inject a number in the middle of it, I better make sure that it evaluates as a text value at some point. All right, so here's how we can do this. I'm going to inject in the middle of this URL string two double quotes, and I'm going to need to do it here for this 1933 as well. Okay, so there's two double quotes because we're injecting in the middle of a string. And I'm going to do two ampersand, which is basically the way that you do concatenating here in both Excel and Power BI for that matter. And I'm going to place in the middle of this our year variable. So we had a year variable, so I'll place that in here. And I'll place that in here because the URL itself is expecting it to appear twice. And then just to be certain that the year is brought in as a text instead of a number, I'm going to make sure that this gets converted to text. And the way you can do that is there is a number dot to text function, and in this case sensitive, you need to have a capital T and capital T on to text. And I'm going to make sure that it gets converted to text because the URL is text, and that means basically that my parameter needs to evaluate as text here as well. So it looks more complicated than it really is, but basically I added in what I have highlighted here twice. I replaced the hard-coded year with a number dot to text of the year parameter that we've created and that will inject the year in the middle of this function that we're trying to do. All right, so we've now taken care of that. We've placed in, we've made this dynamic. Now, if I hit done, you'll notice that it converts this into a function. And basically, a function is something that's waiting for me to pass a value into it. It's, it's actually pretty similar to a SQL Server function in some ways, in that it's a value, or it's a, it's a stored query that's waiting for you to feed values into it. And so if I want to test this out and see if it's actually work, excuse me, if it's actually working, I could hit invoke here and it would prompt me to type in a year. And so I could type in a year, let's say I typed in the year uh, 2016 and hit OK. I can see here that it's brought in just the occurrences, the events that happened on in the year 2016. And so I can see exactly what the occurrences were. I can see all the details that we saw earlier also applied to a year as well. Um, now, if you want to try that out again, you can always hit X uh, to delete that invoke step that we did just a moment ago. So I can hit X over here on the applied step section, and I can hit invoke again and type in a different year if I wanted to. So I could type in 2015 if I wanted to, hit OK, and you can see all the events that happened in 2016, uh, 15, excuse me. All right. Now, it, really our end goal, our end goal is that we want to feed in all of the years that are on that website, not just a few years here and there. I want to feed every single one of the years into this invoke step. And so what I want to do to, to make that happen is make sure you hit X on the last invoke step that I did. So it should be waiting for me to pass values into it like you see here. If it's not, if you actually see data, then it's not going to work. You need to kill that last invoke step and have it waiting for you to pass values into it because what we're going to do is we're going to feed in a list of values to it. All right, so to do that, that's, that's our next step. Our next step here is to pass a list of values into this function that we've created. And the way I'm going to do that is by going back to the website. Okay, so back on the website, if you remember, if I hit back, this will take me to where I can see a list of all of the years that are on this website. And so if I want to get that list of years and make it into like a table where I can pass these values from the table into my function, I'm going to copy the URL up at the top again. Okay, so I'm just going to copy this because I want to get this list of values that I see sitting right here. So I'll copy the URL, go back over to the Power BI desktop, and I'm going to create a new query that gives me the list of years that I just saw on the website. So to do that, you'll go up to Home. And you'll see from the home section here that I can create a new query where it says new source. Okay, so I'll go to home and select new source, and I'll pull in data from the web. So I'll select web and paste in my URL. All right, so this is actually not so different than what we did earlier. The only difference is last time we pointed it to a year, a specific year. In this case, we're pointing it to the part of the website that has the list of years because I want to get that list and then feed that list into the function that we created. So I'll hit OK. 
And this will give me a couple things in here. You'll see there's a couple different data sets in here. The, the first one is actually the one we want. This one actually has some other information in it that's not really relevant to what we care about. So I'm going to select the first one in here that says accident database where I can see all of the data stored here. And I'll check off that accident database uh, file or really uh, part of the website and hit OK. And that will bring that into the query editor again, okay, where I can see all of the data that's come back from our data set. And the problem, though, that you see here is it looks like this data has now been brought in here as uh, columns. And really what I'd like to have is one column that has a list of all the years in it. So first things first, let's go ahead and get, get rid of this column one. This column one is useless to us. It just has this uh, symbol in here. We want to get rid of that. You can right click on that and remove that column. And then that leaves us with all the other columns that are in here. Okay. And so what we want to do is we want to take this and basically unpivot the results so that we can see all of the years in a single column. And so what we can do is we can select all of the columns here, like so, and we can unpivot the results by right-clicking on any one of those columns I have selected. I selected all the columns first, by the way, and then select unpivot columns so that it sticks all of those values into a single column. Now you'll notice in here that it has column two, three, four, or five. You can get rid of that. We don't need that one. So I'll right click on that and remove that column as well. And it leaves me there with just a list of years, just like we want to see it so that we can feed it into that function we created. In fact, I'll go ahead and rename this. I'm going to rename this one to year. And so that way we have a list of years ready to go. All right. Now our next step is to take the values inside this year column and pass them into the function that we created. And so to do that, we're going to do something kind of similar to what we did with the last example, where we had the file groupings and some unusual data in the file that we wanted to work with, and that we're going to add in a new column. But this time, when we add in the new column, we're going to pass in the, the year values into our function. So here's how you do that. You're going to go up to the ribbon at the top and select Add Column, and you're going to add in a custom column again. So I'll select Add Custom Column. All right, then we're going to call the function that we created in the previous step. So remember, we have all of the queries that we've created over here on the left-hand side. Here's our job salary one. That's the first example we did. Here's our error events function. That's the function we created a moment ago. And you can tell it's a function because the icon next to it. And then here's the accident databases. That's that accident database. That's the one that we're working on right now. And so what I'd like to do is I want to call the function called error events. So you'll actually just simply type it. There is no IntelliSense here, unfortunately. And I want to pass in each of the years that you see here into that error events function. And so to do that, you'll do an open parentheses. I'll go ahead and do my close parentheses here as well. And I'm going to basically pass in the year column into that function by doing it like this. It's not so different than like a function you'd see in T-SQL or any other uh, func uh, query language, for example. So I'm going to call the error events function, double click on the year column that you'll see here on the right hand side, and that'll add it in between my parentheses. And so now what it's going to do is it's going to pass in every one of the years, every one of them, not just one, every one of the years into that error events function. And so I'll hit OK. And you can see it'll take a few seconds. It actually didn't take very long at all. But once it's done, you'll see it appears here like a little nested result set. And so it has the year and then the table that basically represents the value being passed in as a new row over here. And so what you can do, there's a couple things you can do with this, is I can actually select on these. And you can see if you select the cell, you can see below the data that's being brought back. And so this is, I'm looking at 1921 here. If I click on 1923, you can see the values being brought back here. 1920, you can just select it. By the way, you'll notice here that um, 1920 actually includes years prior to 1920 as well. Uh, so just for, for your information, that's okay because we're about to merge all of it together anyways. But what we have in here is a data set that includes all of this data. And now the, really the easiest step here is next where what we're going to do is we're going to tell it that we want to merge all that data together into a single data set. Rather than having to have it as nested views like this or nested tables, we can have it all visible at the same time by coming up to this little custom column that you see here, hit the ellipses. Uh, I shouldn't say ellipses, it's actually an expand button. Hit the expand button and you can see here's all of the columns from our function that will be brought back. So all of our functions, all of our columns will be brought back here if I select this. If I simply hit OK, it'll bring back all those columns. Now, I usually recommend also unchecking this option. This option here says use original column name as prefix. 
Basically what that means is it's going to call all of the column names custom dot date, custom dot abort, custom dot ground fatalities. So usually I recommend unchecking this unless you're worried about multiple columns having the same names. You don't really need that or use original column name as prefix because our original column name is called custom and it's going to prefix everything with custom dot date, for example, or custom dot location. So I'm going to uncheck that, hit OK, and you can see now it's brought back all of the data from every single one of our results. And as I scroll down, let me scroll down, you'll see it actually changed. Look, notice the first column here, 1920. Notice it changed to 1921. Notice it changed to 1923 and 24. And we can see all that data being brought back here. Pretty interesting stuff. So I've got all this data in here. I can rename this query. Let's call this uh, error event complete. Hit close and apply underneath our home section here. And now if I wanted to, we could visualize this very easily. So I could say, uh, I'd like to take this data. Once it gets all of it loaded in, you'll see there were some errors in here. Now the errors, by the way, are really because of the, the website itself. Uh, the website has some funky characters occasionally where someone just had a typo. Uh, so for example, think back to that column. I started splitting columns based on that delimiter. Some, sometimes they actually uh, fat fingered it and did like a, a different delimiter by accident at one time. So some of that data is not included. If there's an error, uh, it just it, you can actually go back and, and deal with the error in some way in the query editor. And so you can tell it that I want to replace those errors with something else. So you, you have some flexibility there. All right, but I have this data now in here, and so what I can do is I can build some kind of a visualization on this. Let's say, for example, that I want to uh, build this out on a scatter chart. Now, the one problem with doing this on a scatter chart right now is you'll notice that there's something going on with my data. Take a look at this with me, if you will, and you'll notice that many of the things that I thought were metrics aren't being brought across as metrics. So I had the number of people that were aboard a plane, the air fatalities, the ground fatalities. The reason I can tell you and I know that it's not interpreted those as metrics is because it doesn't have this little sigma symbol next to it like it does on year. Year, I actually don't want it to be a metric. It's not supposed to be a metric. I'm never going to summarize years or average years. What I will average or summarize is the number of uh, air events that there were and the fatalities there were. I might want to look at that information, but I don't want to summarize years. So there's a few things that we might want to fix here. And so one of the ways we can do that is we can go back over to the query editor uh, by the way, to get back to the query editor, you can click on the Edit Queries here, and I can select Edit Queries, and you'll notice that if I go back to the Air Events Complete, that it looks like it's a bit confused on the data types. Take a look at this. If you look at this with me, you'll notice that the data type indicator that we saw before has a question mark next to it instead of a numerical indicator like we saw in the past. And again, the reason why that's happening is because there might be some fat fingering of the delimiter that we had before, and so in that case, it gets, got confused on the data types. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to make sure that it's clear on what the data types need to be for those three columns. I'll select the three, and then come up to the top here where it says data type, and change it from an any data type, which again, that tells you that it's confused and that it just brought it back as an any data type. And I'm going to make it in here a whole number. Okay, so it's converted to a whole number. You can see the indicator next to the column showing that it is a whole number here now. All right, so I'll hit close and apply once more. Okay, and I'll bring those in. It's going to bring them in just like it did previously. There were the same errors that it saw before. It's going to pop those errors out again. And by the way, if you want to see those errors, you can go back into the query editor and just look straight at only the errors if you wanted to. And so I can notice over here now in my field list that it is interpreting several of these as metrics now. So it has the signal symbol here next to it. It indicates that it is an implicit measure, and I can actually start building out aggregations on top of it, or it's actually going to aggregate by default. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go ahead and check off uh, a board, uh, air fatalities, ground fatalities. I'm going to look at all three of these metrics. I'm going to bring it into something like a... Uh, let's do it as a scatter here. Or no, let's do it as a line. A line makes more sense for this. And uh, what I'd like to also bring in here is the year. And I'm going to bring the year in as the axes here. All right, so what we're looking at here is a data set that shows us each of the fa air fatalities by year. And so what you'll notice here, which is kind of interesting in, in the data itself, again, this is, this is air events or air fatalities. What we're seeing here is it looks like the peak where the most air fatalities were uh, sorry, um, actual, you know, here's the other thing I want to do. Let me bring in one other thing, because this is, this is what makes this really interesting, is I'm going to bring in a count of events as well. Let's actually look at a count of events that are occurring. 
And so I can see when I do that, and let's actually take out a few other things here. Let's take out the, let's take these out for a moment. All right, so what we're looking at here is you'll notice that the uh, black line here is indicated by uh, the number of events, okay? So you kind of see and see when some, some events peaked. And what you'll actually find is the most events, if I had focused just in on the count, you'll notice that the count of events is peaking in kind of the 1970s where they had the most, most crashes. Uh, you also see things like the 1940s. Um, there was fewer, fewer deaths, but there were more events, and that's because they were more single, single passenger planes during World War II where, where events like that would occur and there would be more accidents or uh, crashes just in general. So interesting to look at the data. You'll notice here also, if I bring back the other data elements that I had in here a moment ago, not surprising, as you guys might uh, expect, there was a pink peak in 2001, that's uh, September 11th, uh, where there was quite a few fatalities both on ground and uh, in air. So the data is interesting. It does, does allow you to look at trends over time, uh, where there's peaks, where things have occurred. Uh, and you can see obvious events like 2011, 2000, 2001 there, excuse me, September 11, 2001, uh, showing a major peak. All right, so the, the key thing there though, again, I don't want to make you guys sad about the data set. The key thing there was looking at how you can actually take multiple parts of a web page and import multiple at a time. All right, so I think we have time for one more example. And the last example that I want to do with you guys is creating a calendar table. There's actually several methods of how you can do this, how you can build out a calendar table so that way that if you don't already have a date table so that you, you, know, you really want to analyze things by date, and you do have a date value, but maybe you would like a date table so that way you can analyze things by year and by month and by quarter, that sort of thing. You can create your own date table, and there's, there's a couple methods for doing, doing this. Uh, one of the methods I actually have on my blog already, and I'll share this with you. I'll search this on the side and make sure I get this up here for you. Uh, one of the methods is using Power Query, and, or the query editor, I should say. And so what I'd like to show you is that method first, and then I'll show you one second method which allows you to use DAX inside of the data modeling section to do it as well. So here's my blog that I have on creating a date dimension using the, the query editor section. Uh, I give you a couple reasons why it's important to have a date table here. Uh, I also have several references to other people that have created date tables like this, uh, Chris Webb, Matt Mason, uh, Gina as well. There's, there's some good ones out there if you'd like to take a look at how to create a date table. And then I kind of have my own take on it as well here. It's pretty well documented. Uh, you'll see, I, I feel like it is anyways, you'll see everywhere where there's the two forward slashes, those are actually comments that tell you what each section of the code is doing. And then I also have it parameterized here as well. So what I want to do for you guys is show you how to use this. And then um, we'll, uh, we'll kind of wrap up on this because I've run out of time and I want to have some time for questions here as well. Again, if you search my blog, it's devonightsql.com. And if you just type in date dimension up at the top, you'll find the script for this pretty easily. All right, so here's what we're going to do. I'm going to show you how to use this. Uh, and again, the purpose of it, the idea of it, and why you need a date table, is because it makes it easier to analyze things by dates. It also gives you the ability to add in time intelligence for your calculations that you might build as, as well later. So if you want to analyze things like this year compared to last year, you're, you're going to need something like a date table to be able to manage things like that, to be able to build things like that. So let's assume that I don't have a date table, which in this case you can see here, I actually do not have a date table in my fields list. And so I want to add one. I want to add in a date table. And so to be able to create a date table, you can take that script that I have in the blog. And by the way, that script I have in the blog is set up as a function, so you can actually plug in the years that you want to be able to create the range of dates for. And so what I'm going to do to be able to use that script is I'm going to go up to the Get Data section here again, and I'm going to select the blank query, because we're basically going to feed in a script that I've given you, uh, or that you might borrow from Chris Webb or Matt Mason or Gina. And so I'll hit the blank query option. And so I can see here that the blank query option just gives me an empty query editor ready for me to plug in something. It's waiting for me to plug something in. And so what I'd like to do is rather than using the formula bar, which is given here to you by default, I'm going to go to the advanced editor where I can plug in my query that I've already fully built out. And so I'll select the advanced query. And I'll get rid of all the stuff that's already in here. And I'm going to go ahead and plug in the query that I've written for you. And if we had more time, what I would normally do is actually go line by line through this with you. And I, I might do that to some extent, uh, but I would actually write the whole thing out with you line by line if we had more time. But what you're noticing in here is I have given it, 
a couple uh, variables that I passed in values here. Now, one of the things that you'll notice that's interesting about how the query editor works with M queries is you don't pass in dates like you would in the traditional sense. So if you're used to doing dates like you do in SQL, where you can have the, the month, day, year, or day, month, year, you don't do it that way here in the query editor with, uh, with M. You actually use a date function here, and then you tell it that you want to pass in the year, the month, and then the dates. And so what I've told it here is that I want a date table that has a range of values from January 1st, 2010 to December 31st, uh, 2016. And then what I'm doing basically here is I'm trying to get the number of days between that date range. So that's going to give me the number of days. I'm then doing something uh, where it's taking that list and it's being able to convert that list to a list of dates. And then as I go a little bit further down here, I start to add in things like add in a quarter column. So I'm getting the number of quarters. I added in a year here previously. So I'm using some of the functions inside the mQuery language to be able to generate that. I'm then adding in a week, okay, using the uh, table.add add column function and then telling it that I want to add in a week number using the week number week of year function. Then I add in the month number, add in the month name, and then add in the week uh, day of the week as well. So things like Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, that sort of thing is added in here as well. So this script is already available for you. If I hit done, it's going to create that for me automatically. And you can see here that it's got everything I really wanted in it. It's got the date, the year, the quarter, the month, uh, sorry, the, the week, uh, the month number here, the year, the month name, and then the day of the week as well. And so I can save this as my uh, dates table or date dimension if you prefer. And then if I uh, hit close and load, I now have that table that's referenced inside of my, my, my uh, data model once I hit close and apply. And then I can use that over and over if I wanted to. Uh, by the way, just to show you uh, real quickly, if you steal that script from me, which I am completely fine with you doing that, that's why I put it on my blog, inside that script, I've made it a function. So rather than it having a hard-coded start date and end date, what will happen when you use, use this instead, let me show you the difference between what I just plugged in here and what's on my blog. When you plug this in from the blog, you'll notice that when you hit done on it, it's going to wait for you to invoke this, the, the function. And when I hit invoke, I'll be able to pass in a start date and an end date. So maybe you want to have a different parameter range than me or a different date range than me. You could put in here, I want to start on 1-1, one, one, uh, let's say 2005, or maybe you want to go to even earlier than that, you can. And then I want to end on 12-31-2016. Hit OK on that. It'll generate the uh, thing for me. And it starts with that date range that I provided. And again, that's on my blog. So go ahead and check that out. Copy that script. Use it. Make it your own. All right. So if I hit close and apply, that now gives me, I, I now have two separate ones I just added in there, one called date dem and one I forgot to rename. It's called query one. But it's got both of those now in there for me. And I can use those however I want. Okay. Uh, there's one other way that you can create date tables, though. So if you're uh, kind of if you're new to the whole idea of doing data models and, and really this idea of doing calculations, uh, there is some ways that you can create date tables from your data model as well. So if you don't like using the script that I provided, you can kind of create your own date table as well using a calculated table. Uh, calculated tables are fairly new. They came out roughly, I think, last November or maybe uh, maybe it was last September. I can't remember. But calculated tables just work, work very similar to calculated columns or calculated measures. They're really very comparable to calculated columns. And basically the idea is that you can create a table off of another table or you can create a net new table. And uh, that's what I'm going to show you how to do here next. So if I wanted to create a date table that wasn't using the query editor like we did a moment ago, I can do that by going to the uh, data view is really one way to do it. Let's go ahead and go to the data view. It's an easy way to see it. And so if I go to the data view here inside the Power BI desktop and go up to where it says modeling, you'll see there's three types of calculations you can do. There's a calculated measure, which is usually genuinely, generally, excuse me, not genuinely, generally used for doing things like measures. You have calculated columns, which is for things like maybe I want to concatenate two values together, for example. That would be a calculated column uh, use case. And then new table is just creating a net new table based off of a DAX query that you write. So DAX is the query language that you use in the data modeling side. That is um, what you'll use for creating measures or columns, or in this case, tables. Uh, now, calculated tables, you can actually build and filter down based off of another table. Or in our case, what we're going to do th in this time is actually build off of a uh, function. There's a calendar, calendar uh, function that you could use that actually builds, helps you build a calendar table. So I'm going to click the New Table button here. I'm going to call this my calendar 
demo. Okay, that's, that's what's going to be the name of the table here in a moment. And then what I'll do is I'm going to tell it I want to use the calendar function. Okay, you'll see there's also a calendar auto function, which is pretty useful as well. Uh, this returns a table with one column. And, and the reason you'll see why I'm going to use the calendar table here in a moment, because we can actually do some things that are a little bit different with the calendar function. Uh, the di difference here with the calendar function is it'll return back a list of dates, but I can give it a start and an end date. That's why I kind of like this one. So I'm going to do a calendar function, and I'm going to tell it that the start date is going to be 1-1-2015, just to give it a small date range here. And then I'll do an end date of 12-31-2016. And I'll zoom in on this so you guys can see it. But this is what the function looks like. It's a calendar function. It's going to create a new column for me that has a list of dates between that range. And then what I can do with that, once I have that list of dates, like you see here, I can now build additional columns off of this column. So I can now do new columns on top of this column. And let's say, for example, that I want to return back to month. I would do a month function on top of the date function, uh, on top of the date column. And so now I've returned back the month. And I can do that again. And I can say, well, let's do another column. And let's return back the year this time. And so you can bring back and build things on top of the functions that you've already, uh, or the, in this case, the column you've already created. All right, so let me show you one more example, and then we'll wrap up, and I'll, I'll see if we can answer at least a few questions here with the time we have remaining. All right, so I'm just going to do basically the same thing, return back the year. And by the way, you can also do things like month name. There's a format function that allows you to return back the names of months as opposed to just the uh, month numbers. But you can build it out quite a bit here if you'd like. All right. Well, Liz, I think we only have a few moments left. Do so you have any questions that happen to be queued up already that I can attend uh, yeah. yeah. to? I'll look. I'm going to, my voice is going, so I'm going to let you um, sure, sure. look at them if you don't mind. <laughs> sure, no problem. Um, all right, so let's see. Thanks for your session. session. This practice is creating. Uh, let's try to see if there's a question here. That would be a good one. Uh, okay, here's one. Uh, so this one, uh, can we read data from HTTPS sites as well as HTTP? Uh, yeah, you can actually read data from secure sites as well. You can even, depending on what kind of security is set up on the site, if it has a login, you can, it, you can even prompt it to log in to a site as well. Let me show you uh, what I mean by that briefly here. If I wanted to pull in data from a site that required authentication, there is, uh, if I go underneath Get Data, and select web, you'll notice whenever I plug in, depending on what type of site I provide it, after I hit OK on this, it might prompt you for authentication, or there's actually a section where you can identify the authentication required as well. So there's, there's some stuff you can do there as well. Um, let's see what else. Sorry, some of these are like uh, multiple questions that are tied together, so it's hard to connect the dots when they've been separated. Uh, so here's a question. In the, in the date table, how do you handle unknown uh, and future dates? So Ted, Ted asked that question. So um, what he's probably referring to is oftentimes when you're doing and building out things like data warehouses, you'll have an un, unknown record in there for, for dates to be able to handle those. Uh, because you're going to have, in some cases, things that you just don't know the date of yet. So maybe uh, an employee got hired, but they haven't been plugged into the system yet, so they, they haven't had all their information plugged in. You don't know exactly what their hire date is yet and all that information. Uh, so if you're dealing with things like unknown dates, you could certainly add in an additional record for that. So if I was doing it that, in, that, in that scenario, Ted, I would definitely do it the query editor method, uh, because in the query editor method, then I can have um, additional rows added in using the query editor and the advanced editor. With the, uh, the DAX example I showed second, you don't really have the flexibility to add in additional rows that easily. Uh, so the, really the query editor will be the best route there. Oh, it's already 12 o'clock. Look at that. Um, I think that's probably good, at least for the time being. What I'll do, guys, is if you have some of the questions I was, just wasn't able to, to be able to get uh, in yet, um, I will answer that via my blog. So kind of keep it, I, I wrote a blog on the last session that we had. I'll do one on this one as well, uh, where you'll be able to find the recording. By the way, the recording, if you have questions on that, is usually posted by the end of the week. So you should expect that within the next few days. And um, I think that's it. I'll, I'll wrap, Liz, I'll go ahead and wrap it out because I know you've got uh, voice issues there. But thank, thank, you. thank you guys for joining us. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free uh, to plug them in the chat window and I'll answer them via my blog. And like I said, the recording will be available in the next couple of days. Thank you guys for joining us. Thanks.